But uh, what I'd like to do now is say that corporate school reform is a failure. <laughs> and uh, also open it up for uh, some discussion. This is perfect. We've got uh, just about an hour. And I think that's a good division between talking heads and uh, sort of participatory dialogue. Uh, uh, oh, and by the way, if you do need to sneak out to the washroom, you just right over there. Um, but what I'd like to do is open it up right now for uh, comments from the audience. And if, if you get, if Pat and Ken want to speak to one another uh, across what they said, that's fine too. But um, if you want to ask questions or make a statement or offer a criticism, any of those things are welcome. Before you speak, you have to say corporate school reform. <laughs> <laughs> I do now. <laughs> I canceled two flights when I was coming here, and I, and I, I, I have bad luck on planes, but not that kind of bad luck at all. <coughs> I, will, I will say this. Um, I communicated a situation to uh, Rich Gibson, who's a long time co-founder of the Rouge Forum. He's just been out of the country, and he, he expressed his regret that he was able to re-enter the United States <laughs> without being hassled, and maybe, that maybe he's lost his critical <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Now, I was worried about somebody read something I had and would make fun of me while I was sitting up here, but this tops that, right? You got in the country, and I didn't. I got yeah. yeah, I I'm going to say corporate reform is because what is the goal of corporate school reform? Problem. Exactly. It's been highly successful. If we say it's a failure, we're going to somehow assume that the goal of it was educating students. And I don't think it ever was, ever has been, ever will be. And I work in Chile, uh, and we'll talk about this later in our tomorrow, but you know, they've had 40 years of service. And it's a great success. There is no more public education in Chile. And the students have been on strike for a year and a half. So the only place left to be educated in Chile is in the streets. And so I think, you know, we want to, from our perspective, as educators who care about thinking and uh, engagement and learning, it's a failure. But from a corporate perspective, it's fantastic. It's also failed on its own terms, though. The ones well, that, that the proponents put forward as the ones that really matter, which is cutting costs and, and increasing standardized test scores. And so yeah. my emphasis on this is to emphasize that we need to spread the word as, as hard and fast as we can, that the justifications for it are, are baseless, right. no matter how you look at it. Right. I mean, so even within the, 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 the way that they're selling the model, doesn't live up to that, right? right. But, but in terms of their, their selling model, and everyone's buying the model. You're right, but it's expanding rapidly. No question about that. Uh, it's okay. the, the, the statement is they're liars, right? They're locked. What they're after is profit. Right. What they're saying is that they're right. selling the other one. I, I think Abe would speak in favor of what's happened to me, Chile. Not in terms of, the, but in terms of learning in the street, right? The, 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 the institutionalization of it, the separating learning about rather than from. At least that's what I can argue. We got it through Wayne, so I'm not sure that it's you know, accurate. <laughs> Any questions? Have, has corporate schooling, has there been profit and for whom? There has been a, a massive amount of profit, billions of dollars of profit for test, um, public, test creators, test publishers. Pearson. Or Pearson and CS. ETS, which is a nonprofit company that has multiple um, for profit companies that it actually controls. Um, the educational management organizations, the, the, which are the for profit management companies, that's a highly concentrated industry with only something like eight companies controlling 80% of the, that market, um, they're, they're thriving. They're making a fortune. Um, 
school commercialism is expanding also. Um, charter, chartering is a varied situation, but the pattern is the same in the sense that certain states like uh, Michigan, I think 70 percent of, or 70 or 80 percent of charter schools are for profits. In some states like Illinois, where I live, um, charter schools have to be nonprofits, but they subcontract with for profit companies for the management in many cases. So we get around it that way. <coughs> when you read the right wing think tank literature, like Andy Smerick writing in um, Education Next the magazine, he's an American Enterprise Institute fellow. He says, we on the right should support charter expansion um, in the short run because then we can declare it a failed experiment and then we can um, undermine the traditional public schools and justify wide scale private industry contracting. I, I think that's what the American public is getting uh, about the rapid expansion of chartering for the Democratic Party supporters. has a book called the same thing over and over, talking about school reforms and how they've worked, how they've not worked. He's at the American Enterprise Institute too. And he, the argument of the failure to um, uh, produce the numbers that they're supposed to produce, he says that's not what's important. What's important is a good business plan. That's a direct quote uh, from what's going on. It shouldn't be that you have to have proven that what you do will work, evidence-based uh, decision-making. It's is it a good business plan and should we try? Pat mentioned the, the key idea that's, that's behind all the stuff, which is creative construction, that which they alternately call churn. And that's the crucial issue, that they want the closing and opening and closing and opening of schools, which is really just all about contracting. And the, I think that part of what I've tried to do with the, this mantra about the failure of corporate school reform is to turn around the, the, the declaration of the failure of public schooling that's been repeated and repeated for the last uh, two, three decades. And um, that's been a linchpin, I think, for um, the success of corporate neoliberal restructuring of corporate school reform. So my day job is, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, if you still have a comment, uh, I had a question that's slightly off of this. All three of the presentations in some way or another kind of touched on these corporate school reforms or neoliberalism as being uh, kind of a threat or an attack to creativity and um, critical thought and teachers' work and insofar as critical work. I wonder if you could speak directly to the challenge of um, the deep intellectualization of teachers um, and the difficulty of overcoming that dissonance. Um, because, for example, there, there are many teachers where if you even say the word neoliberalism, number one, you'll get a blind stare, or number two, they assume a whole bunch of things that are, are, are completely naive theorizations, um, but nevertheless, they, they have them. So my, my question would be, um, this corporate hollowing out um, of the curriculum in a public education, it's having these really disastrous effects on the teachers as well. So could you speak to that challenge? Um, so um, the D part suggests that at one point teaching was an intellectual practice, that it had been proposed to um, uh, whoever was interested in taking those jobs as it was um, uh, constant problem solving uh, 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 creative endeavor. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, you can uh, demonstrate that uh, as a large movement, uh, at least in the United States, in a teacher education format. So, so the D part is the. It, it, I'm not sure that we that we have to re because we we didn't have it in the beginning. Uh, I mean, at, at some point there was a golden time when uh, schools were um, intellectual uh, places. Uh, so that, that may sound like I'm trying to uh, not say anything, and I think I'm doing an excellent job. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> 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 yeah, the, is, the, issue, uh, the issue is, is that, that that notion that we're recovering something, I'm not sure uh, that we're there. 
But I do think that it had, it certainly has that potential, right? For creative people who are thinking all the time to take uh, a curriculum development and its relationships to life uh, as being an intellectual constant uh, drain that would have me drinking probably more than just Fridays, uh, you know, with the, with the challenges of, of, of what's going on. It seems to me that the, the way in which to uh, get um, the undergraduates that I teach to think about um, problems is to pose it in specific statements. Like when, when uh, Ken was talking, uh, my day job is I work with um, uh, kids who are uh, positioned as struggling and learning to read and write, okay? And uh, I had a, a, a parent call me just the other day saying that um, my first grader has been uh, described as um, illiterate, he's six, and, and that he needs help on a regular basis, and so he went to Kaplan, which is a, a private organization for tutoring. And the statement to him is, we can fix him for $5,000, <laughs> okay? Now, if you put that in front of kids, 20-year-olds, we have 20-year-olds, right, who are there, and you say that story, you tell them that story, and you make that statement, and you get cap, and you talk about Kaplan, and you turn them loose on their machines where they're finding out who, what Kaplan is, what, what it means to be uh, classified as uh, illiterate in first grade, why that happens, it's through a thing called dibbles. <laughs> they can't read oh, fast okay. and mm -hmm. accurate enough in order for them to uh, uh, score at a certain point, so they're a problem to the teacher because her numbers aren't getting to the point that she needs to in order to get over, all right? You turn them all loose on those kind of issues and you keep asking questions, they get smarter fast, right? I don't think it changes their lives or anything of that sort. They s still go um, and, and have fun in their own ways. Uh, but a number of those kind of instances where you, where you ask, I, I was calling it reading wide awake, right? Which is that you wake up to these kind of statements and then trace them right back to, well, how does somebody make this kind of statement and not be, and not feel that they're slimy well, when they make it because the person, he was sincere. He would fix him for five, for five thousand, meaning he would get him more accurate and quick it, for five grand. It was going to be two hours a day. This is six six year old, two hours a day, extra training with a tutor, five grand, three months work. So that would be my my statement is to try and bring those kind of what I would call absurdities uh, to the surface and trying to dig at where they come from and how people can think of justify it. And they justify it through the way in which they they connect rationality and power. It, 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 we, we call, I call it capitalist, you call it capitalist. Uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, that's what Abe would, would, would call it. He would call it colonial or modernized or something along those lines. But so that's my, I, I talked a lot, so I'm sure go ahead, um, I, I think another related vantage point on this is the, the pattern that's going on now is to um, remove teachers' autonomy um, in a number of ways in standardized testing and value-added assessment and um, changing teacher evaluation um, are at the center of this and they're, they're being used to um, justify scaling back collective bargaining power. And I think that what needs to be understood is the relationship between that and the, the kind of quiet expansion of the various forms of privatization. Because the possibility of um, actually extracting profits out of schooling is dependent upon paying teachers less, um, burning teachers out, turning over teachers, and the unions are one of the things that are in the way of that. So, I, and I don't think the unions actually get that there's a relationship between um, anti-intellectual reforms um, and what the end game in this is. I'm not sure whether they get it. I, I've, I've worked with uh, AFT to some extent. And, um, but I, I, I truly think that um, th 
the, there really needs to be um, much more widely understood that the um, the way time and labor is controlled to prohibit intellectual activity of teachers is part of a project to actually extract profits out of um, exploiting teacher labor. So. I have a question. Now, <clears throat> I agree with you, corporate school reform has failed. <laughs> the problem is that the subject, corporate school reform, is not a subject. It's not an agent that we can identify very clearly. The other side is public schools fail. But when you tell teachers corporate schools fail, we don't know what type of schools are we talking about. It's this diffuse entity that made very difficult our criticisms to stick to the teachers. Are we talking about the charter schools? I mean, we're talking the charter for profit, the charter not for profit, the private. What exactly is our enemy? <laughs> we define that because the corporate thing, my students don't get it. Really? Yeah. They are coming, you know, it's like, uh, do you know which corporation controls your school? Uh, no, I work for you know, this Lutheran school. Uh, all good people. Uh, my private school has, uh, you know, public purpose. Uh, they have, it's, it's harder for them to say corporate school reform fail. I mean, when I when I've been writing about this for the last dozen years, I've been describing it more commonly as neoliberal educational restructuring or neoliberal school reform. And um, one of the advantages of that is it links it to the global. Um, conservative movement um, and suggest that it's not just about uh, education but um, I think that corporate school reform has a kind of uh, negative valence to it that has a lot of discursive power for people I think that Diane Ravage's crappy book um, I mean, it's, it's valuable in some ways informationally but it's extremely limited in terms of its political analysis discussion of cultural politics is downright neoconservative. Um, it has no sense of the broader political economy. But it's an expression that, that um, she uses, and um, it's grabbed the attention of a lot of liberals and progressives, as well as um, more critical people. I think that, um, you know, I think that I've tried to stake a claim to what corporate school reform means and make a distinction between public versus private control with regard to um, economy, with regard to politics, and with regard to culture, and to say that we have to look at how various forms of, in particular, privatization, like the private ownership and management of schools, um, and deregulation models like chartering, how these are part of a shift from public to private control. Sometimes ownership, sometimes control. But you don't identify in the discussion the private school is failing in the same way as the other side says, with, you know, without any shame, public schools fail. And the public schools fail discourse sticks. And we don't have the private schools fail. Well, right. It's counterintuitive for many people. Could, could I just, I mean, yeah. what I'm talking about is not private schools have failed. I'm talking about the privatization of public schooling. That is a, is a failed experiment, whether you're looking at educational management, but do you organizations, you, or charters. When do you get a better response when you present this? When do you get more mobilization? When you attack neoliberal models? When you attack corporatization? When? When the public respond better to you, that's my question. Because I assume with this group of people, I can say neoliberalism. And everyone knows what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, when I gave this talk that I gave at, at Occupy Chicago and Occupy the South Side, I would have to explain what neoliberalism is in order to um, enter into the conversation, which I do sometimes um, when I have new students, teacher education uh, students. They initially, when I, if I say neoliberalism, they think, oh, it's liberalism. 
That's, Fox News told me that's bad. So that, that, that really needs to not just be unpacked, but then, I mean, repeated almost every class session. Participatory democracy is voting for uh, Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, it's the, it's the, the uh, understanding of, of what, what needs to go. I, I would be very, I, I, my example, I was trying to be very specific. You start with Kaplan, they can identify Kaplan, they can see that it's profit, they can find it on the, on the uh, uh, stock exchange, they, can, they, they see that their, their statement is, it takes money from you in order for us to start. Uh, kind of I, I agree with you that uh, if you if you name Kaplan and you name uh, ETS and you name Pearson and you name those and then you, it's sort of an inductive sort of way from this is what this means. I'm sorry, I cut you off seven times. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. no, let me start again. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I guess I have to preface my question. Okay, now, I have to situate it. All right. Um, I come from Georgia, which is a state where 54% of the population thinks it's convinced that Obama is Muslim. Um, it also, in the Republican primary, voted overwhelmingly for Newt Gingrich. Uh, so I, it's probably one of the reddest states in the country. Um, it just got a $400 million grant from the rise, uh, race to the top, and one of its uh, one of the categories within the grant proposal was pay for performance. And um, so in my students, when they uh, are learning how to do their uh, undergraduate uh, teacher education program, one of the things they have to do is learn to write scripted lessons. So they are actually writing the script that they will read when they teach which is insane, of course. <laughs> um, and so I want to know um, where, and this whole anti-intellectual thing about teaching just drives me crazy. But what I want to know is you have this cycle. And you have teachers in the public schools who are forced uh, to you know, uh, prepare students for these you know, standardized exams and, and are punished on you know whether if their students do poorly, and then you have the teacher, the, the kids that are going to be teachers, being trained to do exactly that. So I want to know where you break into that cycle, and 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 change this whole corporate commodified schooling. Thing. Does, it, does that make sense? So I mean you know so give me the answer. Well, I thought you said no, it didn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so there's my, my question. I think you could take the flip side and, and focus uh, on giving, giving I think it's important to ask the question, where is the location mm -hmm. of teacher education? So we recently had a, had a conference on eco-justice education activism at, at Eastern Michigan University where there was an elders talk where elders from Communities who had who had, who had founded schools in Detroit um, were talking about their life histories, the history of the movement, um, and how these educational ventures had had germinated out of decades and decades and decades. And this goes to a deal, a, a, a point I think about social networks and relationships that oftentimes you know incredible schooling sort of blossoms out of very nonlinear. Uh, relationship building and net networking and that our, 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 our time, the way that we perceive time is so narrow. So I think when, 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 when young people or prospective teachers are immersed in those intergenerational um, environments where they see how these um, uh, 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 successful community-based schooling um, ventures come out of, of decades of community building, and then they're connected into those networks, um, then I think that that, that provides a, a very jarring experience for them. And, and they see what, what, what is not corporate, <laughs> um, not corporate schooling. Um, the, other, the other, I sort of sit in a very intermediary place where I'm involved in an organization called the Southeast Michigan Stewardship Coalition, where we, we uh, it's a coalition that is 10 schools in Southeast Michigan 
with a bunch of community partners and we it's an intensive professional development um, program. So part of what we're, we're finding in that program is that when you when you bring people together across boundaries and and you actually use um, you know theories of adult development and and teacher learning um, and you put a lot of resources there right so so you have coaches that are in the schools you know showing you know you don't you don't have to teach the test or do this community based learning work you could do both let me show you how to do it but it takes a lot of resources um, and it's very resource intensive and especially in very chaotic schooling environments where where principals are flipping every other second and so on but you could create these resistant spaces that are that that um, you could create these resistant spaces but it does take a lot of collective cognition and, and and social networking over long periods of time and in some ways it's very difficult because things are so urgent right now um, and yet we have to move uh, be a little patient because <laughs> things just uh, happen over a long time window. You know, well, my, my, my concern too is that you don't want to be extremely interventionist either. Yeah. You know, you don't want to say, okay, well, I have I have the answer. It's not it's not writing scripted lesson plans. It's you know doing this. Um, but I just, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe some of you talked about this. I'll just start in and out. But I'm just wondering about. Um, Kind of what you're saying, just teacher education programs as like sites of resistance. So I'm a doctoral student at UBC and I teach in the teacher ed program. And you know, I like to think after students come to my class and I teach like sociology of education, they become pretty radicalized, but then at least the situation here, if they really struggle to find a job, mm -hmm. there aren't like jobs for them. And so there's this issue of, okay, that was all nice and mm -hmm. fine, but now the reality is I need to find a job, there aren't any and like any resistance or any political consciousness they have is really just seeped out of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, I'm from the US, I don't know if it's what the teacher ed programs are like there, but it's, um, it's really hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. There isn't anything across the curriculum in the teacher ed programs, any conscious, like, you know, it depends on who you get, mm -hmm. what instructor, the time, all of that. And so it's just pumping out all these, these just, it's just reproducing the same yeah. mm -hmm. type of thing. So I don't know if um, what your thoughts are. You know, I guess you work in teacher ed, yes. and have you seen the teachers? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm not. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting and excellent point that you've made, and it raises another issue about the staffing of teacher education. UBC, are you a session on it at UBC? Well, I'm a doctoral student now. Doctoral student yeah, is teaching. So I teach you know, contingent labor yeah. in teacher ed. Um, people teaching sessionals, adjuncts, whatever, are really in the same boat as the new teachers who are trying to get a job. So this, I think that's part of the explanation for why you get the reproductive effects within teacher education. But there's another phenomenon I think that you hinted out there. It's to me, um, from old school kind of sociology of teaching, going back to Willard Waller, um, the, the idea, and, if you, and then if you look at the, the, the research in the 80s around um, the, soci, the, the sociology of teaching, and the way teachers, new teachers, uh, novice teachers, want to be accepted uh, and validated as professionals. And if you have, like as Bill described it, this cycle where the, you know, kind of the, the, you have a standard narrative of accountability in the role of the teacher. It's very difficult for uh, people in teacher education to, to give that resistance message when teachers are bent on, new teachers want a validation as a, uh, an accepted professional, as a professional identity. So I think what happens a lot is <coughs> teachers might be exposed to some critical thinking in a particular class or from a particular instructor, but like they've always done, they have their student teaching or their practicum, and then they come back to inform you that, hey, really, where it's really happening is out here. Because you guys back at campus don't know. And you have, what happens is I think a lot of the time, people internalize, they internalize the, the, the foundational ideas of that narrative of what it means to be a teacher. 
and it's difficult for them to, it, the project, like Ethan was talking about, is really about, you know, how do you teach people to strategically comply? You know, first of all, they have to understand that that's necessary, right? I mean, we can't even get to the redefinition, but, you know, trying to teach people to think about strategic, strategically complying to the, to the demands that are placed on them as teachers, but that also requires them to hold, at the same time, an opposite point, a resistance point of view. And it's asking a lot for novice teachers who are striving for that uh, uh, validation of professional. It's asking a lot of experienced teachers. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I gave the keynote address to the annual general meeting for the BC Teacher Federation. Our teachers are working at the moment without a contract. There's been a draconian legislation ordering them back to work and in fact stripping them further of their rights to collectively bargain. Um, one of the things that I talked with those 700 uh, representatives uh, in the BCTF about was the importance of using the context of their jobs to resist. So they were ordered back to work. There was a three-day strike. They have to, our teachers union has to seek permission from the Labor Relations Board to go on strike, which they got. They struck for three days, and then they were essentially <coughs> ordered back to work simultaneously while they were on strike. Um, they're uh, still without a contract. They're forced into mediation uh, with a mediator who's actually one of the architects of the bill that force them back to work. Um, I talked with them about the importance of being in their workplace, but engaging in resistance in the context of their workplace. So they were stunned at the suggestion that that was a possibility. So one of the things, and Ken mentioned this, the idea of teach-ins, and they were like, that it, this had never occurred to them. They have a good, strong union, not necessarily very progressive in terms of its strategies, but I said, look, you can go to school and you can do what you're supposed to be doing, that is that you can teach, and you can engage kids around issues like what is neoliberalism? How is it that it affects my work as a teacher and your work as a student? You can, uh, they don't, the teachers are engaged in a job action where they're not doing report cards, for example. I said, invite all of the parents to come in, and you can teach them about what it means to assess students. You can also inform them simultaneously about how their own kids are doing. You can get them engaged in a collective kind of way. But they're not very well schooled or prepared to figure out how to do that kind of uh, very strategic, uh, working within the boundaries that are acceptable kind of resistance work. And we need to help them, and I don't actually think, I mean, I pretty much have given up on teacher education. I'm <laughs> much more interested in working with people who are already in the schools because they have uh, the possibility for a sense of agency that new teachers simply don't have. Just, just give them a credential and send them into the school, and then we'll help them figure out how to be good teachers and how to do these various kinds of things. Uh, I'd argue that they have been really well schooled. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I would, yeah, I would say that the schooling is, the, is a sense of dulling, and, that, and I apologize to the fellow who talking about the intellectual. But I, I think the institute, the way the institution is set up and getting grounded up even more, is that they're 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 reading has become narrower and narrower to a certain kind of confidence down to your point. I, I haven't forgotten it, the, the notion that, that they need to write a script in order, mm -hmm. in order to deal with it. Well, if you want to work with specifics, you, you ask them if they want fries with that. Right. Okay, because that's where that comes from, which is if they say you want fries with that, there's 11% more, there's 11% increase that they say yes. <laughs> Uh, Starbucks, they're one every three feet in this yeah. country. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if they say hello to you when you walk through the door, you're likely to buy two items rather than one item for a, a seven or eight percent more in time. So this notion of scripting the kinds of things that people say is a customer service kind of idea in order to elicit certain kind of responses, right? 
So it's in, it's in trying to open up the scripting and what the scripting might do by saying, look, you run into scripts all day long. You want fries for that, you want those kind of things. I, I, I think that the, 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 the particulars, again, right, that get them to recognize that you're trying to get them to be competent, right, which I call reading for competence, so that you can fit in, as you're calling it, in a certain way, right? But you also got to work on their imagination so that they can see what you're saying too and you were saying also, so that they can see beyond the particulars of this situation right here in order to think, but why is it this way and what could it be uh, 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 kind of work? But, but that's the tie. I mean, and it's a tie directly to the corporate world. I mean, it's, it's a direct issue. And, the, and if you want to talk psychologically about it, it's kind of a behavior this notion of if I give you this stimulus, you're going to press the pellet uh, uh, lever uh, uh, more often than, than, uh, than not. Uh, it, I, I see it as a, uh, a, a, an interesting way of trying to get them to understand that actually they're being free labor too, um, because it's cheaper to have them write the script than to buy the script from like these pubs. Yeah. So, uh, Bob's Slave. Right. Yeah, success. Well, success for all. Success for all. Rather than paying Bob to write for it, right? Which you know he's got a set of names that they you know, work for. I'm sorry, you were. Yes. To organize ourselves outside the state was one of Abraham's uh, suggestions. Uh, that's pretty challenging. Uh, because we need to, uh, first of all, uh, find the right guy for that, uh, and really find those uh, scripts. That you have. So how do we uh, talk about, uh, you know, this dichotomy between public and private that you were talking about? without making reference to the co-option of public spaces. How can we talk about um, uh, the market or the marketplace of ideas uh, without making <coughs> reference to uh, the use of coercion and service of self-assertion? Uh, how can we stay away from those uh, dichotomies those binary dichotomies that we were talking about in the presentation, uh, without uh, reinscribing ourselves in that same dynamic. That's too hard a question, sorry. Next. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the state's the enemy in the United States, right? The issue is that um, Intervening in your life in particular ways, and it's and all, and, and that's necessarily bad. It's code for bad uh, uh, kind of work. Uh, I mean, bad uh, practice. Um, I'm not always sure that the state has to be bad. I'm not suggesting that it's good right now in the way it works, but I'm not positive that it has to be bad. And there are parts of the state that I like, like public schools, right? I like roads. I like being up here because you can get uh, public transportation every, everywhere. <laughs> Probably can in, in Chicago, where, where I come from. Yeah. We don't. We, we've got nothing like that. Um, uh, so, so I would have had fun uh, talking with Abe and learning from him about what what he means by that. I, I don't know that he's saying. Well, he works for a public institutions, right? He works for the University of Texas at San Antonio, right? And he he. Uh, got on a, a bus to come up here, right, from from uh, Seattle. from Seattle. So I don't know if that's a private deal or it's a public uh, service or along those lines. So that would be my nervousness upon on the easiest part of the many questions that you would ask. I'm not. I mean, I, I think there's multiple ways of thinking about the state, how the state's involved. If, am I demonstrating I'm not an anarchist? Uh, I can. Uh, <laughs> 
we could Skype my son. I think he is. So uh, <laughs> I don't know where he is right now, but we could get him. Um, Mark. Yeah. Thank you so much for this panel. So so moving and interesting and. I think a, a point that, well, first of all, we're on the street is that uh, corporate school reform has failed. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Right so that's, that's sweet. I'm going to get a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> I really like the panel and, and, and I have a question in mind, and, and, um, but it goes to the line of questioning that's currently happening. You know, over the years, um, I've been drawn more and more to the perspective that, that Abe uh, follows. And, and for me, I think in the constructing of, of the panel and the ideas on it, um, and, in, and, and in the uh, Team Shannon paper, yeah. that I know you and your son wrote it together. Well, uh, all the parts that make sense are good. <laughs> well, you know what, something I liked about, uh, many things that I like, but something I liked about your paper was you start off with some of the, uh, you know, Marxist conceptions, uh, even espoused and recognized by mainstream economists these days, and then went on to talk about some people that might self-described and described by others as kind of postmodernist and post-structuralist, represented a kind of really big tent notion of how these things can be useful for us as radicals. And then the inclusion of Abe on the panel as well and Wayne's reading of some of his ideas. Um, like for me, you know, sort of uh, being drawn to the philosophy of, of, uh, of um, libertarian socialism myself is that, you know, it, it's very basic and lines up with a lot of the things that have just been talked about, period, that you know, workers control um, their working lives and avoid being alienated, that surplus value and wealth produced by workers should be controlled by workers, and that working people should show solidarity and mutual aid um, and fight together against all forms of coercive uh, authority. Uh, and so those things are so in line with, you know, um, and, but for me it, goes to, it also goes to the question, so I'd like to thank Wayne and the organizers and then in your paper particularly how you drew a few of those things together um, but the notion of the state, you know, I mean, there's always society, but there's not always states. And even when the, the state is gone, even for a short amount of time, and I'll give an example, society keeps going, and, and that's really scary to states. So, for example, uh, I'm an expat living in, and working in Australia, and we had an election, and now there's like a minority government that's put together with, you know, uh, 